And here we go. We have liftoff. Propulsion continues to be normal. Our 68 chamber pressure looks good. Following up. Unfolds to go. Indeed. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. This is methane to be igniting the flare, correct? Yikes. You bet. We don't need any more of these. Good morning, everyone. You are taking a look live now at uh, Virgin Galactic's headquarters down at Spaceport America in New Mexico. As you can see right there, the mothership and its spaceship Unity are getting ready to take off with people on board. I am Sawyer Rosenstein, and I've got a great team joining me here for today's coverage. And uh, let's make sure we got all those 5 by 5s in chat. We do. Uh, so joining me today is uh, Alex. How's it going, Alex? I'm doing great. It's always a really great day. I see they're at Spaceport America to launch some people into space. Absolutely. And uh, also joining us here is Ryan. How's it going, Ryan? Going well. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Uh, the weather looks okay, and uh, looks like we have a bit of a takeoff roll going on. Yes, uh, this I, that was, I believe, the feed from Jack Byer, who's also out in the field. We'll talk to him momentarily, uh, as, yes, as he mentioned, it is uh, on the roll. So you could see there in the middle, that is the actual uh, spaceship portion of it. Uh, that is what will eventually detach before igniting an engine and taking the people that are already on board inside up to space. Uh, meanwhile, that is the VMS Eve, the mothership that will be taking it up. So let's get a quick uh, update on what exactly this mission is while we watch it roll out to the runway. Uh, Ryan, do you want to take that? Sure. So on board, uh, in terms of crew, we have uh, John Goodwin, Keisha Shahaf. Uh, we also have Anastasia Myers and Virgin Galactic's Beth Moses. So the first person uh, on the list, let's go with John Goodwin, uh, because they are astronaut number 11. Uh, they're 80 years old. They're the first Olympian to travel into space. They competed in the 1972 Munich Games, and they're also going to... Uh, Fingers crossed in, uh, I'd say, probably in just over an hour's time, they're going to become the second person uh, ever to travel to space with Parkinson's. Uh, uh, that's after uh, uh, Michael Richard Clifford uh, travelled into space on STS-76 aboard Space Shuttle Atlantis after being diagnosed as well. And then we have two seats, uh, which were actually uh, won in a competition, I believe. Uh, Keisha Shahaf, uh, uh, astronaut number 12, the first female astronaut from the Caribbean. Uh, they are from Antigua and Barbuda, and uh, their uh, daughter, Anastasia Mayers, is also coming along for the ride with them as well. They're, they're uh, 18 years old, the youngest person uh, in about an hour's time to travel into space, they're astronaut number 13. And to make sure everything's going okay, uh, alongside them in the cabin will be astronaut number 2, Beth Moses from Virgin Galactic. They're the chief astronaut instructor, and uh, they were the lead astronaut instructor carrying out all of the training and preps for this mission, which is Galactic O2. There's Beth on your screen now. All right. Now, as it continues its uh, rollout to the runway here at Spaceport America, Alex, can you give kind of just a quick rundown of what we can expect to see during the flight itself as it taxis back here? Uh, I believe you may be muted. Sorry, I was muted because I, I got a call uh, before, and so I didn't want to, to get that in. But yeah, the, 
right now we're looking here at that rollout of EVE and Unity on Spaceport America's runway. We should probably see that, that take off in a few minutes as it sort of puts itself into position. It'll roll out there to the, to the end, uh, go around, and then position itself for the takeoff uh, rollout. Now, once it takes off, it usually takes about an hour from, from takeoff to drop, usually between 50 and 60 minutes. Uh, from from takeoff to the drop, it'll slowly get up there to that uh, drop altitude. I believe it's usually around forty to forty five thousand feet in altitude. I believe, um, and yeah, it's gonna be mostly just circling around, uh, you know, around the the whole complex uh, there at Spaceport America, and hopefully, yeah, in about maybe an hour or so, we're gonna see that that launch of of Spaceship Two. Once Spaceship Two is dropped. Uh, then the the hybrid solid motor on on Unity <clears throat> is gonna ignite. I believe it burns for about fifty seconds uh, to reach to about Mach three in speeds, and it just pulls up and and goes up into space to about between eighty to ninety kilometers in altitude. It drops uh, then the the feathering system that it has. So that it can rotate and let the passengers view the Earth from the cabins, uh, cabins windows that they have as well, and so that should be a really, really interesting view for them. <laughs> oh, that uh, yes, that's an understatement here. Uh, <laughs> so yes, uh, it appears as if it's getting ready to roll and take off, and then as you mentioned, it'll take about forty-five minutes or so to get up to altitude. Uh, and then it should hopefully get ready for the drop. Uh, this vehicle in particular does it's, have an area. That's, oh, yeah. Am I, I, I believe it, Jack is yes. a little robotic. Uh, but as you can see, we also have our own camera there. That is Jack as well. Uh, helping to capture the takeoff here and hopefully, weather pending, the drop itself from the ground as well. At least the camera is getting the, the, good, the good internet. <laughs> Jack sadly not, but, you know, his camera is getting it, which is what it's important right now <laughs> to get those. I mean, that, that is a really good view, though. Oh, yeah. Uh, and at this point, we are hearing that the chase planes that will be following alongside have just taken off. So that should mean that VMS Eve is next. Um, let's see here. Uh, as we wait for that to take off, um, we will also be answering a bunch of your questions throughout the stream today. So... Uh, if you have any questions about the mission, about the crew, uh, anything like that, you can tag us at NASA Spaceflight. And of course, we will track this flight all the way up and then hopefully with the crew all the way back down. It's a little tricky with the haze there, but it appears as if we're about to start rolling. Yeah, all we're right. just standing by for that to happen. Exactly. And I believe that's one of the chase planes there uh, in Ooh. the right uh, picture in picture. Uh, as you can see, that's starting its engine now, I believe. That's what that looks like. And um, that's getting ready to go as well. So I believe what will happen is because that's obviously a, 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 a smaller aircraft um, that will probably roll out um, onto the runway ahead of uh, VSS Unity and um, VMS Eve and then uh, uh, take off in front, or it will wait for the spacecraft to uh, take off. There are the two options that are available for that aircraft there. Um, but yeah, obviously, it's a smaller aircraft, so it needs less, uh, less runway in order, to take, in order to take off. Here's a question for you, Alex. Uh, we got Koldar asking, are there people in both ends of the mothership? So who's pilot? You know, are there pilots aboard the mothership there? How many? And why, are there one on each side, something like that? Ooh, you know what? I don't know about the where they are located because obviously it's a double fuselage uh, aircraft, and usually, normally for this kind of aircraft, you see only one of them is occupied rather than both. Uh, but I do know the pilots are uh, on MS on VM VMS Eve, 
And they have actually flown before on Unity, but today they are on VMS, uh, VMS Eve. And they are the ones actually for the last flight. Those are Nicola Pisile and Mike Masucci. If you remember, the last flight of Unity was flown mostly by Italians, uh, except for the Virgin Galactic uh, instructor. And this time around, they are the ones on VMS Eve. So they're not going to go to, to space today, but they are going to have that important task of carrying Unity to that 40 to 45,000 feet altitude. Uh, and yeah, it's really, it's really incredible, right? That they can take turns. And in that same sense, as you say, that today's Unity, uh, one of the pilots um, previously flew on Eve a lot of times, uh, but now she is... Um, Kill Latimer, she's going to be the pilot, one of the two pilots for today's uh, Unity flight. And the other one is going to be uh, Freddy Starko, which was also a shuttle pilot um, back in the day. Now I mentioned shuttle, so everyone can just, you know, take off that from your bingo because it's already out. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and it wasn't me that made the first mention, so I just want to point that out. Uh, let's take another question here. I'll answer this one really quickly from D.A. Swanson asking, what's the closest New Mexico City location of Spaceport America? So, yes, we keep mentioning that this is located in Spaceport America. The closest city to it would be a city called Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Uh, and yes, it was named uh, kind of in a contest after the old television show. Uh, we have a question here from... Oh, look at that. And it's we have the roll. Going. There we go. You can see it's speeding down the runway here. Look at that gorgeous shot there. And we have liftoff. It is on its way. Oh, wow. Such a beautiful sight. And again, that, uh, yeah, so that is uh, four people and two pilots aboard the uh, Unity in the middle, and then the two pilots aboard the mothership right there. So we just had that takeoff at 8.30 a.m. Mountain Time. So maybe we should see that the drop usually occurs about 50 to 60 minutes after that takeoff, so... It's a, it's a it's not always exact, but it's a good rule rule of thumb, uh, I should say. So yeah, off they go. It didn't it didn't even have to use like barely any of the twelve thousand feet of runway available at Spaceport America. So just for a bit of context, that's uh, the runway at Spaceport America is about the same length as uh, as Heathrow's runways in the UK, and uh, for, uh, that's just my general reference, which I have um, access to. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit shorter than JFK's longest runway, uh, probably about the same as LAX's runway. So if you think, you know, general international hub airport size, that's kind of the length of runway we're talking about. But as you saw, it uh, rotated far, far, far before the end of the runway there. So um, plenty of margin left at Spaceport America for Virgin Galactic. Exactly. And I think the important thing is also it's not so much needed for the takeoff. It's more for the fact that uh, once VMS Unity comes back, uh, basically, there's no going around. It's a single engine with solid rocket motor, so once it burns out, burns out. So you kind of need that. You're once you get to Apogee, so you need to, you need to, you need to make it first time. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. So just in case you have a slightly long landing, you've got that extra runway, just in case. It is always good to, to have a little bit more. Yep. Exactly. And now, I'm just looking at the altitude data here. It looks like we've just passed through 10,000 feet and um, flight radar reporting a ground speed of approximately 170 knots. So those of you who know your airplanes, it's, a, it's not the fastest climb in the world, um, but it does slowly and surely get up to about 40,000, 50,000 uh, before the drop. And this is a wonderful zoom that we've got here from uh, Virgin Galactic, I believe. Yeah, that is an absolutely gorgeous view. Uh, and you can see the flight tracking data on the left side of your screen there as well. What you will notice as this flight continues is it will end up doing sort of a racetrack pattern. As opposed to normal planes, which will just keep climbing in an 
almost a, a straight line in a way, unless ATC turns them. They have a certain area in which they are allowed to operate, where the airspace is cleared for them and them alone. So you will kind of see it skirt near the mountains over there and then come back around uh, a couple of times, typically, before the final drop. Yes. As you're saying, it's still heading north at the moment. Uh, if you look on flight radar, don't be confused. There are two planes. Uh, it appears that there are two planes stuck on it, uh, stuck on top of each other, Virgin Galactic 03 and Virgin Galactic 04. Um, the reason you see that is because, well, technically these are classed yeah. as two different aircraft whilst in the atmosphere. You have the mothership, which is currently holding on to, or rather the, 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 the spaceship, which is holding on to the mothership there. Um, so, And they both have their own transponders for when they separate. So it may look kind of confusing right now as they begin to bank to the left on flight radar, but it's perfectly normal. There's no there's no glitches or anything. It all looks... Uh, it all, all looks perfectly fine for this phase of flight and it is exactly. kind of true that, that that there are two planes stacked to each other because you can see there that it is actually the case here <laughs> it really is the case and it's uh impressive to see always for sure and i'm You're... you can get a real good angle there of the of the solid yeah. rocket motor uh, or rather hybrid. the hybrid rocket motor <laughs> yeah <laughs> on on the on the rear of the spaceship there you can see that it's angled uh angled nozzle there as well um Real, real cool shot there. Absolutely beautiful. To kind of go along with that question, we have uh, LivyCop003 asking, will they be going to the edge of space? Alex, you want to take that one? Oh boy. Well, that's that's sort of the, the question, right? Because there's always this sort of disparity of, of opinions, whether their altitude that they go, it's actually space or not. Uh... Look, to me, if you're so high up already, you're probably already... Like, the, the, the difference is minimal, in my opinion. I think that by all instances of purposes, you are pretty much in space at that time. That's my opinion, at least. Because, yeah, you're very high up. And the energy for this flight? Well, it usually changes between flights. Usually, uh, it runs. It, it it's usually on average around eighty five kilometers, but it depends. Like some flights have been to eighty eight, others have been to eighty two. It it kind of depends also because it's a bit of a manual flight here that we're talking about. So it's not always like even even if it were like an um, an automatic flight, uh, say like uh, Blue Origins, for example, um, you still have some uncertainties there and some differences between flights um, just because of, of dispersions and things like that on, on your on your guidance and, and all of that. So yeah, it's it's usually on average about 85 kilometers high up. But again, it, it might, you know, go between 82 to 85, 88. That's sort of the, the range that it usually goes. And you made a really good point there that I do want to emphasize the fact that that is going to be manually flown. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's an autopilot. It's not like there's, you know, auto docking or anything. Once that hybrid motor ignites, you've got two people that are actually physically flying VMS Unity there. Yeah. And uh, for Galactic Zero One, we got a brilliant uh, uh, shot uh, during the drop from the cockpit after the fact. So fingers crossed we'll get something like that as well with uh, Galactic O2. But you can see there's a real kind of. I wouldn't call it a shunt, but a proper like jiggle as the spaceship is released from the mothership, and then you can see the pilot uh, pull back on the stick uh, as the engine ignites. Um, and you know they both take like fire, fire, and uh, they agree that they should fire the engine. And um, obviously, if they don't agree on something like that, the spaceship can just come right back in and glide back down to Spaceport America because it's at the end of the day, with or without an engine, it's a glider. Yeah, and that actually happened on on one of the flights. I believe it was in. 2019 might have been or maybe 2020 where they flew it was actually I think the first time they they flew here from from spaceport america but that was uh the the motor just basically shut down after the drop and so it they dropped they tried to light the engine it shut down and they just basically glide glided down to the, to the runway just you know that's that's sort of the the whole deal here that they tried to take this seriously in that sense uh with maximum safety as, as always and, you know, that's also one of the things that we look out for this drop as well, that usually the drop happens near the Spaceport America, because they try to have that contingency where if the, the motor doesn't light, then they can always glide down to the, to the wrong way. Hey, 
Trying hey, this Jack. again. Can you hear me? Oh, oh now we can hear you. Jack. Yes. Just wanted to, just wanted to do a slight clarification uh, for just you know being one hundred percent accurate purposes. What you said, Alex, was correct. Um, mm-hmm. That was the first powered flight that they attempted from uh, oh, Spaceport right. America, but they had done several several glides uh, glide flights. So just exactly, wanted to throw yeah. that out there. We were out yeah, here for that right. one. That was a good one. Yeah, I remember that one. I remember watching when I was just a viewer <laughs> of NSF. <laughs> All right, That's I'll be back in a little bit. I have to relocate to get under the spacecraft for drop. I'll see you guys on the flip side. Sounds good. Thank you, Jack. And yes, thank you for being out there. Jack drove all the way from Starbase out to Spaceport America for this. We really kind of have our small team here, but doing some amazing work, especially Jack out in the field. So thank you, Jack. And thank you, everyone watching as well for your support. Without you guys, we would not be able to do this at all. And of course, thank you to Virgin Galactic as well for providing additional video feeds like the one you see here. Uh, Speaking of support, uh, we have a couple of people that I would like to thank for their support. Uh, Zach, thank you for becoming a Red Team member. Marvin, uh, contributing to the Sawyer Pun Token Fund. I appreciate that. Uh, We have Cooking with Cows saying cheers to Sawyer Berenstein. I guess I'm one of the Berenstein Bears now. Flawed Perspective, happiness from the Burt Rattan Fan Club, amazing design. Uh, Musical Wolves Robotic Bacon Fund, uh, Ryan with five Red Team gifted memberships, uh, and a couple more here from Musical Wolves. Always love seeing your name in chat. Thank you for that. Musical Wolves asking first, can this be counted as a launch or flying? I think the answer to that would be both, because you are going to be launched from underneath the vehicle, and then there will be someone hand flying it both in on the edge of space and then on its return back to the runway. And now here's a really good one as well from Musical Wolves asking, can the plane land with Unity attached if they need to abort for some reason? I do think so, yeah. Because mm-hmm. they do they do captive test, fli- te- uh, test flights with uh, with Unity and they actually land with, with Unity underneath the center wing. So I, I think, yeah, I'm mostly sure that that's a possibility. And they've done transport flights as well. So yeah, that's it's true. Kind of, it's kind of important to be able to land mm-hmm. with the spaceship when you're, when you're transporting it across the country, say from Mojave to Spaceport America, which is a, a journey that the Virgin Galactic are very used to. Indeed. Here's a question from Ross, and I'll throw this one to you, Ryan. Are there any scientific payloads on board Or is it mainly just crew? Because the last mission that we saw, I believe, had a lot of science experiments they were trying to do. Yeah, the the crew from the Italian Air Force, I believe it was, they had uh, special suits on. They also had a rack at the back of the spaceship, uh, which you could see um, pretty much immediately as they as they were given the clear to take their seatbelt off. They're up and away back to the to the to the aft end of the spaceship to to get those experiments going. Uh, From the uh, information Virgin Galactic has provided to us, I believe that the only um, kind of objective for this mission is for the crew uh, to to go up and have a a fun time and um, and, uh, try and uh, capture some of that overview effect. Um, which you know that's kind of what what they've what they've um, what they've won slash paid for. Um, so that is the uh, from what we've been provided. I believe that is the the sole objective of today's flight. And of course, Virgin Galactic gets more data with every flight, um, which they can use to uh, to to uh, improve upon the next flights. Um, and also on board, uh, it's important to mention uh, Beth from Virgin Galactic. Um, uh, I think she's technically still testing out the customer experience, uh, which they can then uh, obviously improve for later flights. Look at that view. That's amazing. And as you mentioned, yeah, the first flight was primarily Italian military. So this is, uh, I believe, the first official paying all civilian mission in this instance. Mm. And also worth note, uh, John Goodwin was, I believe, one of the original or one of the earliest people to buy a ticket for Virgin Galactic now getting the chance to fly. While we and have you can see the sun, sorry, sorry, but I was just quickly pointing out you can actually see the sun glinting off the rear of the spaceship. There, this is a beautiful shot. Um, sorry for interrupting, but yeah, it just looks real pretty right now. 
It does. And in that view, you can kind of see that pointy thing at the end. Alex, Matt Gaming is asking, why does Unity have a giant nose spike? I believe it is related with the uh, with, um, um, probe that they have to be able to gather extra data during these first phases of, of flights for Unity. It might be removed at a later point, but I'm not fully sure, though. Like I, I think that's that's a data capture probe. I think it is, it is likely to be. Not I'm not uh, an airplane uh, expert though. Uh, I'm more of a of a spaceflight guy, but I believe that is the intention here for that for that spike at the at the nose. Very similar to what they did in the early space shuttle program uh, during the approach and landing tests with space shuttle Enterprise. Same deal of trying to gather that extra mm. bit of data and aerodynamics and things like that. And that one actually has to be removed uh, for when they tow uh, Unity around. Because once it lands, they need to, to tow it. And I think they have to remove it for that. But I'm not fully sure. I, I remember them having to remove that for the, for the Galactic Zero one. I think we, we saw them doing that for, for the previous flight. Here's a question uh, from Joe Kangas asking, uh, and Alex, I'll throw this one back to you for a second. Since you're the space flight guy on this part, why <laughs> do they use a hybrid motor instead of, say, uh -huh. a liquid propellant engine? Well, that is a, an interesting question. I'm not fully sure about the exact specifics of the decision, but I do remember that one of the things that they wanted to have is be easily storable and also dense so that it can be packed inside of uh, Unity. Because you can see it's it's big for for a, for a spacecraft, but then on that bigness, so to speak, you also need to have enough thrust and enough delta V to go all the way up there uh, to the edge of the space from 40 to 50,000 feet that, that it is dropped. And so you need something that is uh, First of all, storable, that it's not a cryogenic or anything like that. And then you can also, uh, like, it needs to also be compact. And solids are very good at that. The problem is solids, you cannot turn them off. And so the option here is that you go with a hybrid. I believe the oxidizer, it is the one that is in liquid form, whereas the, the fuel, it is on solid form. So you have nitrous oxide, I think it is the... the the oxidizer for this and and then you can basically shut it off uh just like like any any sort of liquid propellant uh engine but it is also compact just like a solid and so that's sort of the the idea of this hybrid configuration and also uh jack in the back channel pointing out uh that you can also uh shut it off unlike a straight solid you have a lot mm -hmm. more control yep uh, this one's not in the queue, but I'm going to pose it to you anyway, Ryan. As we see this climbing, what is the expected or rough area for the drop itself in terms of altitude? So the last flight, the Galactico 1, the drop happened at about 45,000 feet. Uh, the White Knight 2, the carrier aircraft, uh, by itself, it does technically have a surface ceiling, a maximum altitude of about 70,000 feet. Um, but that's very, very high. Um, that's a... Uh, uh, just uh, just shy of double the uh, the expected drop altitude, so we're looking for around forty five thousand, maybe fifty, but probably forty five is uh, pro the approximate ballpark we're expecting uh, for Galactico two. It's yeah, it has a uh, sort of high end of the ceiling that it can go up to, but I think that usually is in place more for Unity than for the mothership Eve. And uh, yes, there is specific keep out zones and everything provided by the FAA, the no TAMs, uh, yeah, notice to air members. So that's something to also keep in mind there. Here's an interesting question from Lord Savage. And I think this might be more of an opinion question for all of us, but uh, hmm. do you think they'll ever fly Virgin Galactic from Cape Canaveral in the future? Uh, Alex, any thoughts? Well, that will be interesting. You definitely have different views from there. Um, but I'm not fully sure. I do think that Virgin Galactic at one point signed 
uh, contracts to fly from other places, but I'm not sure if those have have been made firm. Um, they do have big plans in the future, obviously, like multiple fleets of carrier ships and and spaceships uh, as well. Uh, but if it happens, it might be way further down the line and not. It, it might not be from Cape. It might be from other places. But it will be interesting, though. It will, it will definitely be quite a view as well. And Ryan, along those same lines, Scott asking, uh, do you think they will have international flights with this system? Well, you, we saw with the um, former sister company, Virgin Orbit, let's put it that way, their flight from uh, the UK uh, in January of this year before they went bankrupt. That was a little bit of a hurdle to get that underway. Um, but they did, get, they did get it going from pretty much all of the, from all of the regulatory sides. I wouldn't say uh, uh, that it's impossible. Theoretically, it is possible. I'm not sure if that's kind of in Virgin Galactic's current uh, mission statement uh, kind of outlook over the next few years, whether that's something they want to implement. Um, but I mean, I wouldn't say it's impossible. They just, you know, they need to build up all of the facilities. You know, they have an entire spaceport dedicated to themselves, basically, um, with with all the all of the facilities there. So um, that's not something you can easily move. Along those lines, Ryan, I think it's important to clarify because I've seen a lot of people asking, wait a minute, how is this flying? I thought they went bankrupt. I thought they sold assets, things like that. Can you help just clarify the difference between Virgin Galactic and what Virgin Orbit was? Yeah, so Virgin Galactic is the, the OG Virgin spaceflight company. Uh, uh, they were founded uh, initially for what we're seeing here, uh, suborbital spaceflight with, uh, with uh, paying passengers on board. Uh, it uses a, uh, a, uh, spe a specialist aircraft called White Knight 2 and um, uses a specialist spacecraft called Spaceship 2. Uh, they, go, they go up and do all of the suborbital stuff, which we're going to see today. Uh, and uh, their kind of whole uh, aesthetic is kind of purpley. Uh, Virgin Orbit, on the other hand, was kind of born out of Virgin Galactic. So Virgin Galactic wanted to do orbital small sat launches from a 747. And um, the Virgin Group, I assume, decided that it would be better to split that off into its own company called Virgin Orbit. Their whole aesthetic was red and things like that. And um, they launched a, a rocket, a traditional traditional in quotations rocket under the wing of a 747 so they're both air launch systems but they're vastly different for vastly different purposes galactic what we're going to see today is for tourism uh, and uh, some uh, science as well which we saw on galactic 01 virgin orbit is was for small sat launches and they sadly went bankrupt earlier in the year yep very different uh it would be like comparing i don't know say twa cargo to american airlines you know, totally different purposes, and one of them is no longer around, was kind of absorbed. <laughs> Here's a question from Timothy asking, Alex, how long can the rocket spend in space at a time? So how long is the actual space portion of the flight, basically? I believe they are for about two minutes, three minutes or so in microgravity, but I'm not sure how much of that is in actual space because, again, it's a bit of a subjective kind of thing where whether you ask per people or not. Uh, I usually take the, the McDowell line, which is 80 kilometers, um, for many, many reasons that I'm not going to explain because it's too long of, a, of an explanation. But I will say that if you take those 80 kilometers, it's probably around one minute and a half. But the microgravity phase is actually a bit longer because, you know, as they coast up to the apogee and then the down, down uh, part of the, of the flight as well as they go back uh, into the atmosphere. So there's, like, the microgravity environment lasts for longer than the piece of, of the flight that actually is in space, so to speak. But yeah, it's about a minute and a half, two minutes. And also, I'm just going to quickly uh, uh, plug a future video we have coming uh, with hey, Jonathan hey. McDowell. Um, uh, a, a video, um, basically, we're going to see what is actually space, where is the edge of space. Das has done uh, uh, an interview, and we're going to uh, we're working on a video to try and clear up all of that because it gets a little bit messy, like 80 kilometers, 100 kilometers, 120 kilometers. Where is the line? Is it a gradient? Is it a line? You know, all of these different questions we all always get asked. So uh, we're throwing that into a video with Das. And um, that'll be coming uh, uh, over the next couple of weeks or uh, in the future at some point. There you go. All right. Now, while we have you here, Ryan, I know you made some fancy graphics go along this. So 
with this, so I will ask it to you. Uh, we've talked about the people that are kind of on board there, but who exactly is on board the VMS Unity hoping to go to space today? Yep, so um, I've, I've, I'm looking at the numbers. We've had a, a fair few people join us uh, since we started the stream. And um, um, I, I, I'm just <laughs> waiting for Patrick to catch up here. Let's give him a minute. Um, uh, but yeah, so uh, for everyone who's uh, joined us since the uh, start of the stream, we're going to uh, kick it off with, uh, let's go with John Goodwin. Uh, they're at the top of the list on uh, the press release that Virgin Galactic gave us. Uh, John Goodwin uh, is uh, going to become the first Olympian to travel into space uh, after competing in the uh, 1972 Munich Games. Uh, they were a canoeist, I believe. And um, after being uh, diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2014, they're going to become the second person with Parkinson's to travel into space. Uh, that's uh, following on from uh, Rich Clifford, who uh, flew with Parkinson's on Space Shuttle Atlantis for STS-76 uh, back in the 90s. Uh, next, after John, uh, we have uh, Keisha Shahaf, uh, who uh, will be, uh, who now is labelled uh, astronaut uh, number 12. Uh, they're from Antigua and Barbuda. They're going to be the first female astronaut from the Caribbean. And um, they won uh, the uh, two seats on this mission uh, following a uh, competition, uh, which also raised uh, $1.7 million uh, in grants for uh, the uh, non-profit uh, Space for Humanity. They're also going to become the first mother to travel into space with their daughter, that being Anastasia Mayers, number 13, astronaut number 13. Uh, they're going to become uh, the youngest person to travel into space. They're 18 years old. And um, obviously, uh, they will be the first daughter to travel into space with their mother. Uh, they're also uh, born in Antigua and Barbuda. And also on board from Virgin Galactic themselves, Beth Moses, uh, they're the chief astronaut instructor. And uh, for this specific flight, they're the lead astronaut instructor. Uh, they'll be on board uh, with the passengers and um, Galactic O2 will make uh, mark uh, astronaut number two's uh, fourth flight into space with Virgin Galactic. And those astronaut numbers, it's not like in space total. Uh, these are um, designations uh, which have been given by Virgin Galactic themselves, uh, just more of like a not really a PR thing, but more like a personal thing for the for each person who travels on a Virgin Galactic flight. You know, you know, I'm the eleventh person to fly. I'm the twelfth person to fly. They're just numbers that are given by Virgin Galactic for their crew. That's great, and it's really international crew, which makes me want to ask a question. And I apologize in advance to all of our YouTube moderators here, but I'm curious where everyone's watching from this morning. I know uh, we've had people from all over watching. Now that we've got the multinational crew here. Because this is, I mean, this is just really exciting. Uh, if we still see it flying, it's always great to see people going into space, and it's always great to see where you're from as well. I wonder if there's someone from from T1 Barbuda here as well, because that's really exciting. Like, hey, people from from the Caribbean. That's not a that's not a usual thing that you see, right? And so that's yeah. really cool. Yeah, I was and gonna also say, I'm going to I'm going to do a personal shout out to uh, to John Goodwin from the UK. You know, the last person we had <laughs> from the UK in space was Tim Peake. So, you know, oh, true. Shout out there. Yeah, uh, seeing a lot of people waking up here in the eastern United States. Uh, there's southeastern UK, Taiwan, Greece, Poland, Ohio, uh, <laughs> San Antonio, Texas, Mozambique. Some great international love here this is awesome so everyone who's watching out there thank you we really appreciate it and love seeing just how international our audience is here too someone saying pluto not sure about <laughs> that <laughs> uh i mean as long as they say somewhere on earth you're likely okay but yes it's probably somewhere named Pluto on Earth. You know, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised about that at all. We'll have to. I don't know. New Horizons already went by it. We can't double check. Oh dear. Well, in addition to all the amazing people who are watching from all over the world, we also get support from viewers like you that help us bring this stream to you, uh, including Jim Cavett saying great views. We appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, D.A. Swanson becoming a Pad Rat member. Uh, Hack Illuminate 63 also becoming a Pad Rat member. 
Stephen Shard, thank you very much for gifting five Red Team memberships. Remember, if you do get a gifted Red Team membership, make sure to thank them. Uh, Mike, uh, Nicole Bowen, thank you for becoming a Pad Rat member. Uh, and Kyle here asking, and Alex, uh, I'll put this one to you. Uh, what is the max speed and burn time after drop? So how fast do these guys get to go? Yeah, so uh, so far, the maximum speed that Unity has reached is about Mach 3, so about 900 meters per second or about. And usually, the burn lasts for about 50 seconds, so a bit under one minute. It's sort of the burn time of that hybrid motor on Unity. Yep. Awesome. Uh, let's see what we got here. I have a question here from Yak Kerger. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Uh, Ryan, I'll put this one to you. Are the pilots sitting in the left or right cockpit, or could they sit in either? So I believe, I uh, haven't had this uh, uh, confirmed, but I believe it's, uh, it's a... Um... Similar to uh, oh, what's it called now, Rock um, from Strato Launch. Now the pilots are sat in the same cockpit. I'm not sure whether it's the left or the right one. I have a feeling it might be the right one, but I'm not sure about that. But they are definitely sat together, and they use one cockpit for all of the primary control flying, um, because you know it just simplifies our process instead of having to you know talk to someone who's uh, a few meters away on the other side of the aircraft. You can't exactly travel between them during flight either. It just, you know, adds a whole nother layer of complexity things. So keeping everything consolidated, one cockpit for all of the main operations, and um, uh, that all, uh, uh, it simplifies the whole process for flying. And I do want to point out, you can see again, some of the data from the flight on the left portion of your screen there. It appears at the moment the vehicle has leveled off at about 44,000 feet. That is according to the, for those who know aviation, ADSB data uh, that should be coming down from uh, EVE and Unity here. See, so, I see some people in chat that were saying that you, that you should use port or starboard. <laughs> yeah. I think that's... We know what we mean by by left or right. It's it's okay the port and starboard uh, lingo, but yeah, just in case we're not in space yet, know. we still have an up and down until until it leaves the atmosphere. We still have an up and down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and also a reminder to point out there, uh, they don't call them pilot and co-pilot. It is uh, the commander and the pilot. And that's the same over the uh, the, the mothership and uh, VSS Unity, um, because um, you know you, you on your business cards you don't really want it to say you're the co-pilot of a space plane. You want it to say you're the pilot of a space plane, but you can't have two pilots, so they have a commander and a pilot. They're doing it space shuttle style. I like that space shuttle style. Let's take some more of your questions here. Uh, here's one from Takeda asking. Uh, I see that the mothership, as you can see in this view as well, does not have winglets. Does it simply fly too high to benefit from the redirected aerodynamics? Is it something maybe to do with the aerodynamics of the vehicle underneath it? Oh, hang on. First, we Ooh, have our that. first inside views of the crew aboard VSS Unity. So I believe that uh, in the who's just moved their hand there, I believe that's Beth Moses in the bottom right of your picture. Top right, I think that's John. Uh, top left, uh, I believe that's Keisha. And then uh, uh, bottom left, I think that might be Anastasia. From what I can see, you are correct on that. And I always love this view just inside here, which they first showed us during Flight 01, of all of the windows and everything surrounding it. It's really a cool vehicle. And don't worry, the ship hasn't suddenly extended into two parts. At the back, that is a mirror. Uh, so the, shi the ship is much shorter than it looks from this, from this perspective because there is a mirror at the back. And that is cool because you can see yourself floating around. You don't have that. That's another good, I've never thought of that before. That's a good yeah. point. Me neither. It's... I wonder if they're gonna. I was about to say I wonder if they're gonna take any selfies, but the the you know this the, the ship has cameras installed like on every window, so you know kind of redundant to to try take your own photos when the when the vehicle will do it for you. 
yeah, you can actually see some of the cameras there, one at the base, uh, one above the mirror. Uh, there are cameras all over the craft to capture everything. And again, a big shout out to Virgin Galactic for providing us both the internal and, as you see here, the external views as well. While we have this view up, I really love talking about this particular engine nozzle. Uh, you can kind of see that it's actually angled. Uh, Ryan, why is that? Uh, well, it needs to climb up. So, you know, by having it angled, it uh, kind of uh, uh, assists in that in, in, in that maneuver. And um, yeah, it, uh, the entire uh, launch uh, profile is uh, more of a... Um, it's a, it's a drop. It needs to get clearance from the mothership. I'm just trying to think how to explain this. So you drop, you get, you get clearance from the mothership, you ignite, and then you kind of need to fire up and uh, climb in front of, but also up over the mothership. So um, in order to get as much separation as possible, uh, it, it's just kind of for that maneuver. It's pretty tricky because you have to drop and then you have to get out of the way. And it's a, you need to go above the mothership, but you begin under the mothership. So it's all just to try and get that maneuver out of the way um, in order to minimize the uh, possibility of uh, any kind of uh, uh, safety zone confliction or anything like that. Yeah, it really helps with, with that angled um, that angle chamber. You also have the... Because as you mentioned, it's also just uh, going up. So you don't need to go like left and right or even go on a power flight downwards. That act, that's actually what you don't want to to have here. And so instead of having like a thrust vector control system, like a gimbaling system, just angle the nozzle in that way, and that already helps you on that, you know, on on that lift up to the basically to space. It kind of helps you that way. Right. There's fewer moving parts, which most mm -hmm. of the time is actually a good thing here. So. It's it's such a brilliant little design of rather than developing a whole gimbal and engine moving system, just design the engine so it goes up better. Yeah, simple, more reliable. You don't have more moving parts. It's also lighter, so it gives you a lot of a lot of flexibility there. In that sense, there is one unique moving feature though that uh -huh. VSS Unity yeah. does have. Can you talk a little bit about? The feathering? Uh, to me, yeah. So the feathering system that it has, so the VSS Unity, the way that it is configured is it has its main fuselage, but then the wings can actually angle, and so they can be rotated by 90 degrees. And the way that it, so the reason why it does that is because while it lands as a glider, it's re-entry down to the, through the atmosphere. It's actually more like a capsule in the sense that it just passively goes through the atmosphere using the, the basically, because the the wings are, are angled 90 degrees from the fuselage, what it forces is the body just forces in itself um, belly down, basically, through, through the re-entry. And then once it is through the thickest parts of the atmosphere, then the wings come down, uh, they defeather, as they call it, and then it just basically becomes, an, again, a glider and just glides down to the, to the wrong way, which is a really neat thing to have because you have both the easiness of uh, landing on a runway uh, for a glider, but also you have a safe re-entry uh, a stable re-entry, um, just like a capsule, in the sense that you don't need to have anything else other than, yeah, the, the, the wings rotate to feathering uh, position, and then you just re-enter just like that, and don't need to, to have, like, thrusters or engines or anything like that. Uh, it, it all goes down uh, on its own. It's such a unique system. It's really cool to see, and hopefully we'll get lucky enough after they uh, ignite the engines and everything to see the maneuver happen like that. Uh, it appears we may have an updated idea of when we can expect drop. Uh, Ryan, what are you hearing? So the clock that we've gotten from Virgin Galactic, I've just done uh, mathematics, uh, uh, looking at approximately an uh, 11.22 uh, Eastern time conversion, that will be uh, 9.22 Mountain Time, where this uh, flight is currently taking place. Uh, for UTC people out there, uh, that's uh, that'll be 15.22 UTC. That's an approximate 
uh, uh, time uh, that I've uh, calculated from the clock uh, we are getting from Virgin Galactic. So what's the time now? That will probably be in just over 15 minutes time. That's what we're expecting. And that will follow sort of the, the rule of thumb that I was talking about before when they took off. They took off around 8.30, so that's 52 minutes after the takeoff. So that's that's pretty much the same as previous times, yeah, 50 to 60 minutes. There we go. So now we are getting much closer to what we can hopefully see will be the drop, the ignition of the engine, and more people going to space. Uh, Looks do like you we're want to take some thumbs up from the crew there quickly in the back? Um, uh, John showing the OK sign to Beth in front. Yeah, probably doing the the last few. Are you are you okay? Are you good to go? <laughs> Kind of question. And it actually, looks like John has uh, got his own. Uh, John's got his own headset in the back there. Look at that! Awesome. Everyone else has got in ears. John's got his own uh, over ear headphones. Proper pilot. There you go. I uh, do want to thank a couple of people here as well for the support during this stream. David Rivas, thank you for becoming a Pad Rat member. Jim Cavett, thank you for gifting a Red Team membership. Uh, King Air 619, thank you for becoming a Capcom member. Reminder, Capcom and above get access to the Discord, so hopefully we'll see you there. Uh, we have Stefan, thank you for becoming a Pad Rat member. Jim Cavett, thank you for gifting five more Red Team memberships. Uh, and Hack Illuminate 63, thank you for upgrading to Red Team membership. Uh, we have a question here from Adrian, uh, not our Adrian. Uh, do we know what type of propellant the spacecraft uses? Alex, I'll put this one over to you. Ooh, I do know the oxidizer. I, th I think it is nitrous oxide, but I'm, I cannot remember right now the, the type of, of fuel that, that it uses. I can, I can find it real quick, though, uh, because I think they actually change it multiple times over the lifetime of like the development of a spaceship, too. They actually struggled a bit with with that engine as well. Um, yeah, but I but I cannot remember right now what was the. Um, I think it is HTPB, which is a really common uh, fuel for for these for these uh, solids. I'm not sure if I'm gonna butch, butcher the the name here, but I think it is hydroxyl terminated poly polybutadiene, which is HTPB, uh, the name. I guess that's yeah. why you get an acronym for that, because it's easier the acronym than the whole name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very true in that case. And as you mentioned, yes, this vehicle has gone through many iterations, uh, quite a few design changes. As you mentioned, the engine and fuel there having been something they've worked on in the past to get to the point where we are now. So it's been a highly evolved vehicle up to this point. Mm. Uh Tim and Matt Travel, thank you for the support. Uh, also asking Ryan, do you think the crew on board the ISS will be watching? I'm going to guess that the crew on board the ISS are probably going to be a little bit busy with their work at the moment, and it's not going as high as the ISS. ISS orbits around, if I recall correctly, about 400 kilometers. This is only going to be going up to around 80. So it's a big difference in altitude. And uh, yeah, the ISS also would need to be directly overhead New Mexico. They'll probably need a pretty good zoom lens as well. So I think it's going to be extremely unlikely any members of the ISS crew are going to be watching along live with us uh, today for Galactico 2, unfortunately. Yeah, typically the only time that they will watch the launches themselves is if it's something historic like Artemis or if it's launching a vehicle to the International Space Station, such as the recent Cygnus launch. We are now coming up on about 12 minutes until the expected release time. Uh, that is expected again at 9.22 Mountain Time, which is where this is happening, and that's 11.22 a.m. Eastern Time. So... Uh, Coming up really close onto that now. And one more here from B0AWS uh, saying, thanks for all the work you guys do. How high up will they go and drink your water? Uh, you were just talking about how high up they go, Ryan. That was, I believe you said about 80 kilometers. Uh, yeah, so the Apogee is probably going to be 80, in the in the ballpark of 80 to 90 kilometers, just over Alex's favorite McDowell line. So, you know, um, 
kind of in space, but you know, as I said earlier, uh, quick plug, we have a video about this coming uh, down the line shortly, um, uh, all about different lines of space. So in my opinion, it goes into space. You can have your own opinions, um, uh, but yeah, just barely scrapes into the edge of space there. Look at this view. This appears to be on top of VSS Unity looking backwards. You can see the uh, vertical stabilizers there. The shiny ones are the ones from Unity. Uh, the ones with the Virgin logo appear to be from VMS Eve as we get closer and closer to drop. It's a fantastic view. Let's take another question here. Uh, Tim V, while we're talking about the plane, uh, does the spaceship have any flaps like a plane? Alex? Uh, does it really share anything in common with a plane? You know, I'm not a plane guy. That's the problem. Ryan, <laughs> you, you're more of a plane guy for this, right? I believe. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm, I have the schematics in front of me. I'm not sure if it has flaps. Uh, as in the the, the aero services that, uh, that yeah. uh, come off in order to um, uh, increase the surface area to make uh, flight at slower speeds more uh, uh, more stable. Uh, obviously, it has your elevators, your rudder, your, your aileron. That's what the mothership mm. has. And um, uh, Spaceship uh, 2 doesn't have a, a, a traditional rudder. And um, also, I guess, on the mothership, the rudder is split over both fuselages. Uh, but yeah, I don't believe either has That's flaps true. in order to reduce the, uh, uh, reduce the uh, minimum speed uh, that it can glide at. There you go. There you go, indeed. Now, it appears we are getting closer than we originally even thought to the drop time. It appears to now be closer to 9.20 mountain time. So it looks like they're going through some final checks. Again, as you mentioned, Beth Moses, uh, who's the person with Virgin Galactic, basically in charge of customer experience, talking with them. You could see some of their hand motions there before. So as they prepare for drop, as we do as well, Alex, can you please give us a run through of what we can expect to see following the drop? Yeah, so once they drop, it's going to be a, a couple of seconds until they clear from from uh, VMS Eve. And then they're going to light that engine, that hybrid motor at the back of Unity. Uh, they'll pull up, uh, you know, to, to go up uh, into space. That burn of that hybrid motor should be around 50 seconds, uh, plus minus a couple of seconds here and there. And once it shuts down, it'll go into that coast phase of... You know, going all the way to Apogee, they'll feel the the zero G and everything. They'll be able to unstrap and look through the windows at the Earth and everything. Uh, the feathering system will be also activated at that time uh, after that uh, burn is ended. Once they go into the thinner parts of the atmosphere, and it actually helps on the whole ship to be able to to sort of uh, rotate as it as it looks back onto the onto Earth and with that feathering system deployed, uh, once they go back through the atmosphere, it'll help them to passively descend uh, through the the atmosphere, do that re-entry. And then once uh, they are sufficiently down uh, through through the atmosphere, through the thickest parts of the atmosphere, that'll come back to the gliding uh, the, the, the gliding configuration that we see right now uh, on the ship there. And yeah, it'll glide down all the way to Spaceport America. That's sort of the the, the the plan for today. Usually that microgravity environment lasts for about two, three minutes. The whole the whole flight up to to space should be about m maybe maybe like a couple of minutes. There we go. So while we're talking about that, let's go to the actual drop, uh, before the drop, excuse me, itself. Uh, Ryan, can you talk a little bit about what's going on and how the drop procedure actually works and what uh, the what EVE will be doing while Unity drops and fires its engines? Yeah, so when the uh, pilots call release, release, release on that third release, if everything looks good, they will, uh, I'm not sure on the exact system, but I know for the sister company Virgin Orbit, it was a manual process with buttons they had to press in the cockpit. So I'm going to assume it's similar with, uh, with Virgin Galactic. They'll uh, do that. And then once they drop, 
and they uh, both pilots agree everything looks good. They'll both call fire, and at that point they will ignite the uh, mixed, uh, the hybrid engine uh, at the back of the spaceship. If everything looks good with that, they'll keep on that. They'll start climbing up towards space, and they'll keep on climbing, keep on climbing until they run out of propellant. From there, the engine will shut down. They'll have a few minutes. They'll do a bit of a backflip at apogee, so the windows at the top of the spaceship get a view down on Earth. Oh, there and we go. We like have release. We have we have release. Uh, this is a Jax feed, I believe, and uh, the two feeds are a little bit different, but we have release of Spaceship 2. There we go. Yes, it has been dropped. You could see that uh, single engine that we showed firing in the back there as it works its way up to space. Again, that is expected to get up to an altitude of about 80 kilometers, which should provide the crew, once they get there inside, about three or four minutes or so worth of microgravity. Again, you can tell that angled nozzle from that previous shot going upward. You can see the con current configuration, at least, of it. And so far, uh, everything looks good. Uh, the crew on board seems to be doing well. And that Jack also doing a fantastic again, job here. Absolutely. Uh, you can see it appears to do slight rotation, as Ryan was just talking about right before the drop. And the, the reason you saw a little bit of a disparity there is because the, the Virgin Galactic feeds and Jack's feeds are, are a little bit different. But there you go. It looks like the burn has finished up there. And Spaceship 2 is now gliding, well, not gliding, but uh, momentuming its way up towards Apogee. I believe the term is coasting. <laughs> coasting. There you go. I, I didn't have the word in my head. Momentuming does the same thing. You know what I meant. You know what I meant. Absolutely. But yes, uh, that looks like the burnout. And as you can see, the crew is now oh, out of their seats. Getting a the chance seat belt to experience. sign has been turned off. <laughs> uh, we recommend keeping your seat belt, seat belts fastened. Uh, all of that spiel. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you there can see the, the feathering. feathering system. There you go. So this, uh, the windows on top will now uh, uh, have a view of the Earth, and uh, the crew will get a wonderful, wonderful view there uh, from uh, approximately eighty to ninety kilometers. Just look at that. It look always looks Earth. spectacular. I mean, you just oh. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. That is gorgeous. And I, again, this is just a personal thing. I love the people who have long hair in space. Once they get into microgravity, it's always just fun. And you can see just the look on their faces as they look out the window. It's almost awe-inspiring in a little bit here yeah. to see that. You can even notice that, that rotation that the whole ship does, because like the the way that the light comes through the windows, it's different as it rotates. True. So right now they are getting a view of the Earth from this particular angle that the spaceship is at. And they will have, I believe, a few more minutes to enjoy this before they have to begin strapping back into their seats in anticipation of uh, landing. And Is I believe, there a... uh, sorry, but Beth over there on the right just seemed to have been taking a picture with her phone there and uh, helping John out there uh, at the back. That's great. Again, he is the, only the second person ever now with Parkinson's to have gone to space. So that's amazing. So now it seems like they're going to be getting ready to begin the reentry. You can see the kind of flip there. Alex, does the vehicle have a heat shield of any kind or does it need one? As we see... Uh, the mothership on the right side of the screen as well? Well, the reentry is low speed enough that they don't need that kind of um, heat shield that we see for other, you know, orbital uh, vehicles. So, yeah, it, it doesn't really need... I th I believe the, the... Basically, the base of the vehicle is already rated for that kind of uh, entry environment. You can see some of that RCS thrusters uh, firing. Because obviously, once you are in space and there's no air up there... You need something to to be able to to maneuver, and so they have these um, reaction control system. I think it is based on cold gas uh, thrusters. There we go. 
So it will be contacting the atmosphere or the thicker parts of the atmosphere very shortly. Once it uh, has slowed down to the appropriate speed, the, the ship will start to unfeather itself uh, back into the gliding mode that it needs in order to uh, well, glide back down to the runway. And um, they can see there the rocking. This is the, uh, and some particles coming up as well. This is the, uh, the entry back into the atmosphere uh, process here. You yeah. can also see it uh, rotating slightly. And it is, once again, worth pointing out that this is being piloted by people. There is not automation in terms of the actual flying itself. These are people that are hands on the stick flying this back down to the runway at Spaceport America in New Mexico. And this kind of rock and for, uh, rocking back and forth, we saw it on the last flight as well. That is a thing that we've seen on previous flights, not a, a weird thing or, or anything. But you can see it's pretty much stable. It's actually falling like a feather. That's why it's called the feathering system. Because it's just passively going through re-entry there. I believe that is Jack tracking this as well for us from the ground, if I can tell correctly from this. This looks a little bit, uh, uh, <laughs> no offense to Jack, but it looks a little bit robotic. So I'm going to, I'm going to, this could also be a Virgin Galactic a, a clean feed that we have here. Uh, sure. But yeah, um, whoever it is, is a good track going on, good track. And uh, shortly we'll see that uh, unfeather procedure there. So the, uh, I believe it might be starting now, actually, I couldn't tell. Uh, from that uh, altitude, uh, but it will start gliding forwards very shortly. Now, it is worth pointing out here that uh, sorry, this is Virgin's feed that we saw previously. Just want to clarify that, but uh, it is completely normal to see this kind of shaking. It is a very there we go. light. Yep, it is feathering. a very lightweight okay. vehicle. Mm -hmm. So it start. You can actually see it start to point down there, and that's because as the vehicle unfeathered. It needed to gain airspeed, and in order to gain airspeed with a glider, you need to point down because that's the way gravity goes. So you can see it start to point down, and the, as it unfeathered, that's just to gain airspeed in order to uh, produce the lift it needs in order to glide back to the runway. And uh, from this perspective, everything looks good so far. You can see the New Mexico desert uh, uh, very well with uh, some, some some cloud shadows in the background there as well. From wherever there, Jack is is taking pictures as well. <laughs> yeah. Right, beautiful, and beautiful. It's important to note in that upper level of the atmosphere, we do see this sometime with uh, rockets where as they get higher up, they do have to combat with upper level winds and forces that are kind of knocking them side to side. It's a little more obvious on a smaller one, such as uh, Rocket Lab's Electron. So this happens to spacecraft that are this high up. So as scary as it may look with the shaking from on top of the vehicle there, the cameras, when we see those, uh, it's dealing with everything a rocket normally does, and it appears to be continuing exactly as planned so far. Looks pretty solid. Also, the, the, the purple paint job is uh, glinting very prettily off, uh, off uh, from the sun here. It uh, looks very graceful from this perspective. Yeah, that was a recent change that they did to Unity, right? Like, uh, I think it was like yeah, three they... flights ago. They rebranded the whole company. They went from the kind mm. of the old kind of a blue eye iris looking thing to a, now like a, a purple gradient kind of deal, uh, which uh, kind of uh, I believe it's meant to reenact the kind of uh, like the, the the changes in the in the color of the atmosphere as you go up. It goes from like light blue and then gets darker and then turns to like a, a deep purple. Well, that's, I like the purple. <laughs> that's actually it. That's exactly the reason for the uh, paint coloring on that. Again, it's continuing its nose downward, and it will continue to lose altitude and eventually start to lose speed for a landing, again, once again, on a runway back at Spaceport America. Uh, while we're doing this, Ryan, do you have some uh, mission stats for us? At least how high did this particular mission go, or what's the apogee, as we like to call it in space terms? Yeah, so I've just uh, I've just uh, scrolled back with the uh, telemetry here. It reached, uh, and I've converted it to metric for the rest of the world. It uh, it reached a maximum apogee of uh, eighty eight thousand meters. Uh, that's eighty eight thousand five hundred and twenty point blah, 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 meters. Uh, so uh, just over, just a smidge over eighty eight and a half kilometers. So nearly reaching ninety kilometers. Uh, as we said earlier, eighty to ninety is the kind of ballpark for these missions. And uh, uh, yeah, that's the uh, that's the exact apogee that Virgin Galactic has provided us. Fantastic. So it appears that means the flight went exactly as planned in terms of the upward portion of flight as we now focus on the return back down. 
Uh, let's see here. Everything looking good so far. Uh, we're trying to get altitude data on it currently as well. At the moment, it is currently dropped off of the flight radar, which obviously it did as well during launch. And once it got to supersonic speeds and all the data readers got quite confused with that portion of it. Yeah, what? Once it goes over 60,000 feet, it goes outside of uh, uh, like the maximum. That's like the border for controlled airspace in the US, I believe. Uh, so once it goes above there, um, flight trackers are just like, well, it's obviously not a plane anymore. So there's no point in us throwing it on a radar. Um, so that's why it gets a little bit confused there. There's a, uh, the, the, the range of ADS-B isn't infinite. It has a very uh, uh, finite range. There you go. Now... Along those lines, I did see a question from someone here asking, do they have parachutes on board? If for some reason something happens at this moment, uh, do you think they would, would they have parachutes or is it just a glide back down to the runway with what you've got here? I, 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 I believe on Galactico 1, they did have parachutes. And um, I think that, uh, I think they also had them I'm just uh, scrolling back now to uh, the, the feed we got uh, from inside the cabin. I believe their backpacks are parachutes. Um, yeah, that hasn't been confirmed, uh, but I believe that is uh, what, um, what those uh, backpack apparatus uh, were. So I believe they did have them. Yes, and thankfully not needed, as you can see it descending continually through the clouds there as well. Let's see what else we have question-wise about the landing here in the meantime. Uh, we do have a question here about the uh, re-entry saying, is the bearing for the re-entry into the atmosphere pre-planned, or do the pilots have to adjust once the feather is deactivated? Alex, I'll put that one to you. Well, I'm sure they have some pre-planned uh directions uh for that but obviously they, they probably have to to correct in you know, like because obviously because this is a very manual flight that you're that you're flying here with with unity there's going to be slight deviations here and there obviously not a lot of deviation but you expect like the plan always has to account for slight deviations here and there and obviously that glide down to to the runway also probably accounts for that as well. So I'm sure it does account for it. Right. At this point, we are now getting where that is passing below 18,000 feet. Now it's 17,000 feet per our flight data that we're receiving. So they don't have any flaps like we talked about, or they don't put anything up to slow the vehicle down. So how exactly do they get down onto the runway uh, at a slow enough speed considering how fast they've been going ryan how's that work well they obviously plan where they're going to be doing their their, their loops with the mothership uh, to to plan the drop and they have they have their they have their zone set out by the faa and once they uh, once they uh, drop and ignite they uh, they go up to the the apogee uh, what was it 88 uh, kilometers um and from there, they really just have to target at the runway. They need to manage the energy, their uh, their, their forward mm. energy with their with their downward energy. So it, it's all a big balance. And these pilots are very experienced, very they're, they're trained for this. You know, they have lots of uh, lots of practice. And basically, it's just like flying a glider. You need to manage your 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 forward energy with your gravity energy that goes downwards. So all of that added together, and the pilots um, through their through their talent and training. Um, make it to the runway and like i mentioned at the start of the stream i'll bring it up again uh, the runway at spaceport america is twelve thousand feet long that's about the length of uh heathrow's runways and um, just a little bit shorter than jfk's longest runway um for some international comparison there so it's a pretty long runway and compared to you know like your your, your boeing triple sevens your airbus a380s this is a very small glider and the energy can be lost pretty quickly with the two wheel landing gear in the rear and the skid at the front. So it doesn't actually have a wheel at the front, this spaceship. It has a skid, and um, which uh, also helps to uh, slow down the, the, the aircraft uh, slash spacecraft once it uh, lands on the runway. So I the chase plane see... fly underneath it there. Yeah, that, that was actually <laughs> what I saw. Yeah, and actually kind of going along that lines of the energy management, you could see right now it's doing what looks like a giant circle 
not necessarily to line itself up with the runway. I mean, part of that, but and you can see lot... it there in the bottom right. Ooh, there's spaceport at there's the terminal. The at spaceport America and That's the runway smaller. are in sight. So, um, in aviation terms, they're they're not they're not flying a, a traditional circuit pattern. But um, for a brief moment, they're technically, I guess you could say, they they were downwind for the runway. Um, uh, but it looks like they are circling around now, and um, they are staying around one one end of the runway in order to have their best shot at landing. And, and that's uh, that circling also does help them with that energy management. It does bleed off any excess speed. Uh, it's similar to what the space shuttle used to do. Uh, yeah. It was called the hack, the heading alignment circle, where um, after they would do their S turns, banking left, banking right, slow down, it did one final turn to line itself up with the runway. That would be a final effort to bleed off any of that extra energy and speed while in addition, lighting it up with the runway, which appears There's to be the what we're seeing here. As well. yep. The ground so getting a, a very lot closer. <laughs> yeah, there was a very sharp bank to the left there, and the flight uh, tracking data is a little bit wonky here, but the ground is steadily approaching. They've stopped banking. They are straight lined up now, and I believe we have a fantastic image. There's the runway, and it looks like we should, fingers crossed, get a butter landing for Spaceship 2. A little bit of a little bit of a float there, and as it, it slows its rate of descent right down there, and it looks like we now just about have touchdown of Spaceship Two. There we go. That appears to be the main gear down. That is fantastic. Putting an end to the Galactic Zero Two mission, uh, bringing four people and two pilots up to space to the edge of space, now landing back in New Mexico. And they have 4,000 feet left to go. That's the three. So soon they'll have 3,000 feet left to go on the runway. Nose gear touchdown now occurring. That skid will uh, even uh, further help to arrest their uh, speed there. And you can see it also some, uh, uh, some dust there kicking up with that skid as the spacecraft starts to slow right down with plenty of margin left on the runway for that landing. And it looks like we have nearly wheel stop. It's just edging forward ever so slightly. There you go. And I think we it's safe to say with that little shift back there, round of applause throughout the cabin and uh, <laughs> we'll stop there for Galactic O2. Uh, that is one happy looking crew that has now been to the edge of space and back. And even if it floated a little bit, like you mentioned, very long runway, plenty of space for them to come back down here. So that, I believe, would be landing just at around 9.33 a.m. Mountain Time. So that's the local time there at Spaceport America in New Mexico. I'm also quickly just going to uh, give a shout out to the carrier aircraft White Knight 2, which is still airborne, remember, everybody. It's still airborne. It banked to the right during the drop, but it can't land yet because the runway is currently occupied by Spaceship 2. So it is slowly descending. It's come down from 45,000 feet down to about 42,000 feet at the moment, and it will continue circling above the skies of or in the skies of uh, New Mexico before uh, Spaceship 2 has been towed off the runway. I believe Virgin Galactic have a fleet of uh, Land Rover Discoveries or something or Defenders or something. Something along those lines they used to tow the spacecraft off of the runway uh, but first of course the crew is the uh, primary concern here they all look a-okay -okay from this perspective and um, i'm sure they'll um, be very excited to uh, to d disembark shortly and uh, tell everyone on the ground about the uh, the flight experience it also exactly. takes a long time for eve to come down like uh because it's it's big and when it has unity it, it sort of takes a, a, a bit of time to go up there but it also takes a bit of time once it it drops unity they have like this wing in the middle and like the, the wings on the sides and everything. You have a lot of lift there. And now you have to basically drop and that wing just wants you to keep you afloat. And so it, it takes a long time for, for Eve to actually go down to the runway because like, you know, dropping from, from that drop altitude down to, to the runway altitude because it, it has a lot of lift. And in the bottom right there, you can see Beth. Uh, she's got her phone out. Looks like we've got uh, look like we've got some selfie action going on there. <laughs> That's one of the benefits here of the space tourism industry is it's it's meant for fun. You get the chance to pop out your phone and take some selfies after you know just go to the edge of space. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that are very happy back in Antigua, where again two of our now edge of space astronauts are from. So there's going to be a lot of excitement, I would imagine, overseas there, especially when they return. 
And uh, looking at their um, the uh, uh, the two passengers' uh, arms there, Keisha and Anastasia, they both have the flag of Antigua and Barbuda on their shoulders. Uh, but I also noticed on Anastasia's shoulder, uh, she has the flag of Scotland there, and I believe that's to uh, represent uh, the University of Aberdeen, uh, which is where she's uh, currently studying philosophy and physics. And also, I think Keisha might have the flag of Israel on there. I'm uh, I, uh, Virgin Galactic haven't provided any information on on where that could be from, uh, but I believe I saw that on her shoulder at the back there. There we go. Now, we do have one question in regards to the landing itself. Do we know why they use a skid on the front and not a wheel? Ryan, do you, as our plane guy, have any idea why you'd use a skid over a wheel? I have to say, I'm, I, I don't know why they use a skid, but I would throw a couple of ideas out there. I believe we also saw a vehicle on the right there uh, uh, through the window. I believe it's just for, uh, uh, for weight purposes. It's lighter than a wheel is. And also, it is, um, uh, it, you, you don't have a brake on a skid, right? A skid is just a skid. It's uh, excellent for, for scrubbing the energy off. And you can see there the crew now uh, uh, getting around the getting around the vehicle there and, uh, and just safing it after its space flight. And um, uh, uh, the Virgin Galactic's trademark fleet of Land Rovers now surrounding the vehicle mm -hmm. there. Looks like they're just tying everything off and uh, soon opening the hatch. Yeah, you can also see them removing that that probe at the at the nose as well. And that will allow them to be able to attach it and tow the vehicle off of the runway. Because again, it doesn't have any more <laughs> engines or power in it, so it has to be towed off. Yeah, and one other example of this kind of uh, space plane that lands on a runway with a skid rather than, than traditional wheels is Sierra Nevada's uh, Dream Chaser space plane. It hasn't gone yet to space, though. Unlike Spaceship 2, it actually have, has gone. But uh, we have seen it uh, doing those approach and landing test as well so it uses that that's geared at the front as well yeah and also i'll throw, I'll throw out the x-15 there classic space plane uh -huh. depending on your definition of space the front nose gear uh it's, it's opposite on the x-15 the front nose gear is a wheel i presume for steering but the back nose gear are skids uh, so skids are a very popular option uh for space planes i guess the space shuttle kind of is is the outlier here with wheels on the front and the rear everything else seems to use skids Yep, and you can see they're working their way towards the crew hatch area shortly. It looks like they're uh, working right at the edge of the wing there. As you mentioned, getting the vehicle prepped, the main thing is that it is safe so that when the crew steps out, they can have their moment of joy on the runway without worrying about any other possible chemicals or things from the vehicle. And, and they uh, will then be taken right nearby to where their family is waiting for them with champagne in hand. And uh, I think we can also see a camera there, a camera operator there on the ground. So fingers crossed we'll get some uh, nice stuff through the uh, through Virgin Galactic from that as well. And also Das pointing out, watching along at home with their, uh, all of you, uh, uh, he paused the stream. And it looks as if out the rear of the spacecraft there is a little air brake that's stuck out below. Uh, mm. So that's also used for scrubbing off speed. Uh, so it turns out it does have spoilers. Uh, it just does not seem to have flaps. Spoilers, it has spoilers. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems as if the hatch is open, ready for disembarkation. Yes, and while we wait for that to happen here, I do want to give a big shout out to Virgin Galactic for providing us with these feeds. These are absolutely gorgeous. It's great to have the uh, inside access to this. So thank you once again, to Virgin. And while we wait for that crew to disembark, I do also want to give a shout out, not just to Virgin Galactic, but to all of our subscribers as well. Uh, it's the support from subscribers, uh, whatever membership level, anything like that, that helps us to be able to provide you uh, some of the views, to be able to provide you the stream, the commentary, uh, especially Jack out there with his camera, managing to capture the drop absolutely beautifully. Uh, so yes, if you're interested, there is a button right on YouTube to become a member. Uh, if you can't do it monetarily, you can always just help by giving a thumbs up and spreading the word of how awesome space is in general. Yeah, and we also just passed 800,000 normal subscribers, which is great. We love seeing everybody coming along for the ride. And, you know, if this is your first time watching and you want to see, you want to see um, 
future NSF live streams, you know. We, we go out and we, we broadcast everything that we can, right? We have people on the West Coast, on the East Coast, in Starbase, watching stuff from Florida and uh, in Jack rolling out to New Mexico, doing insanely long drives to see all of this cool stuff. And uh, hopefully in the future, we'll have more international broadcasts and, and things like that. Like, like we sent mm -hmm. um, Chris G down to French Guiana for James Wedd. You know, we send people to everywhere we can to bring Spaceflight live to you. So if you want to see more of this stuff live, make sure to subscribe because, you know, it, that way it sends it straight into your subscriber box. You know, it just... Everything you love to see. And I believe Jack just joined us as well. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. What a fantastic flight. This is like, this has been a long time coming. And I haven't really been able to listen to what you all have been talking about. So forgive me if I'm repeating stuff you've already said. But it's just, this is a big deal. And it's really cool. And I think we all can agree that, you know, whether, wherever you fall on the, is it space? Is it not space line? Like, to me, it's space. Side note. This is <laughs> this is the future. Whether or not it takes this exact shape or this exact vehicle or this exact company, we all want to live in a world where everybody from all countries, from all walks of life, can travel into space, experience weightlessness, see the majesty of our planet from orbit, and have that moment where you realize how fragile all this is and how special it is. So, yeah. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks to all our members. I'm going to drive back to the spaceport now. Wow. Well said, Jack. It's very, very poetic. Beautiful. Yeah. And it looks like a, a, a white Land Rover Defender there with their sponsorship is backing up to the, mm -hmm. the, the nose of uh, VSS Unity there. And this is, this is how they do it. They attach the tow bar to the front of the vehicle and then just hook it up to the tow hitch of the Land Rover. You know, it's a very... You can see here the scale of the vehicle. It's pretty small compared to other other vehicles. So so what you're saying, Ryan, is that Land Rovers are space flight hardware. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> not your car, though, Jack. Um, <laughs> definitely not your car. The Until only, the the only hey, comparison... If, 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 if real engineering or whatever that YouTube channel is that rules can do a, a hypersonic U-Haul, never say never. <laughs> yeah. the, only, the only thing that, that your car has in common with, with any space flight is that it makes some very similar noise to a rocket. <laughs> there goes the champagne pouring already, it looks like. Everybody seems happy. Yes, or at least the water, if nothing else. Uh, yes, and as you mentioned, you see it being hooked into the back there for it to be towed over. Uh, again, the crew will be able to go be with their families and get to see them again after their trip to the edge of space. Also important, again, the runway needs to be cleared so that way uh, the mothership can actually come back and land as well. Yeah, I speaking say, of though, the mothership, uh, sorry, uh, Alex, uh, uh, yeah, Eve yeah, is still circling above New, New Mexico, but uh, is descended down uh, to 34,000 feet now. So it's slowly coming down, but there's no point for a rapid descent because, you know, the, the runway's got a space plane on it. They need to clear it. Uh, it appears that we have temporarily lost the feed there, so we will keep an eye, as you were just mentioning, on uh, Eve. You can see uh, White Knight 2 there, as it's labeled, uh, continuing to circle above the runway, hanging out about 35,000 feet, it appears, at the moment. Uh, All yeah, right, we have a couple of super chats that came in that I do want to mention really quickly here. Uh, Doc Tubbo, thank you for gifting five Red Team memberships. Uh, Andrew Close, wishing the crew good luck from earlier. And thankfully, everything went great there. Uh, let's see. Richard, uh, been with you for a long time. Thanks for all you do. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I'd rather be flying an X-Win saying, has anyone started a fund to get the leaders of the Flat Earth Society a flight on Virgin or Blue Origin? <laughs> I appreciate that one. Uh, Jay Flattery, thank you for the support. And then Debbie, uh, if it's going to space, why weren't they wearing pressure suits? That's actually a good question. Alex, any idea why they wouldn't be wearing pressure suits? Well, I believe uh, sort of the, the idea here is that they, they're going to be for, for a very short time. It's not going to be uh, an extended period of time, just like you will see, for example, for an orbital flight. And also, you got to think about the the comfort, right? Um, 
they have a lot of safety systems in here, so the idea is that they will not be they they will not be needed. They will not need uh, any sort of pressure suit at all here. Similar to how Blue Origin, for example, does their thing as well, where people are just on on sort of like some special suits that they have for for the flight and and things like that. In this case, they also have that parachute bag as well on the back for for Spaceship Two. But overall, the the idea is that you know all of these safety systems are in place so that you don't need it at all. Um, and you know it's it's also a very short time that you are up there, so that's that's sort of the the thinking here. And there we go. Um, I just want to point out this uh, the 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 radar map we have uh, real quick because if you look at the top near the flight radar twenty four logo, uh, this is the track of the the mothership, and you can see the point of separation uh, over uh, the desert because that sharp bank to the right. Uh, from our perspective to the left under the logo uh, that's where the drop happens you can see just how, compared to all the other circles and uh, banks that the the aircraft has been flying you see just how sharp that bank is there uh, at the point of separation exactly not just that but even the uh the energy maneuvers that it performed uh for vss unity you can see on the other colored line there uh the circling around at least when we had the uh, info from unity on screen as well yeah this is of course the mothership but you know it's a uh, it, it look it, the, the the takeoff data looks exactly the same because you know they took off together there you go and as white knight 2 continues to wind its way down uh i think that is time for us to wind down as well I'd like to thank everyone who helped me out here on the stream today with the fantastic commentary and coverage uh, first and foremost, Jack, out in the field, thank you very much for rolling on out all the way from Starbase and for the amazing view, especially that drop. Fantastic work. And then we have Alex, who joined us here as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you as well uh, for having me. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really a, a plain guy, but it is really good to see people going to space. And also, I should say, we had previously on the stream uh, sort of like a, like a question about flying and launching and what is it all about. If you, if you saw that, that, that ascent of a Spaceship 2, once you look down the engine, it pretty much looks like a rocket because it's a rocket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you as well for joining us, Ryan. Very welcome, Sawyer. Very welcome, everybody. Hopefully you enjoyed uh, our coverage of this. And, and also, I just want to give a quick uh, another thank you to uh, Virgin Galactic for giving us access to, uh, to their cameras as well. You know, definitely helps uh, when we have Jack out there catching the drop. It helps when we can get onboard cameras as well, because we love seeing the crew inside. Yes, love the onboard cameras, both inside and out, seeing how this whole thing works. It's absolutely beautiful. And I believe I neglected to uh, acknowledge Patrick at the very beginning. I do apologize, Patrick, who's been pushing the buttons, pulling all the levers, and helping to bring as many of these views as possible to you. Uh, if I see people saying, you want more, you want more, this isn't enough, well, first, subscribe, and you'll get notified, especially when we do a lot of these uh, live streams, including another one currently scheduled for later tonight with a Falcon 9 launching uh, from the Kennedy Space Center on the Starlink 6-9 mission. So hopefully we'll see some of you there, and you're like, wait, but there's still time to kill. What are we going to do in between? Don't forget, we have 24-7 live feeds from the Kennedy Space Center, Starbase, and McGregor, all available on this channel. Uh, you can also get to them by going to nsf.live. I am Sawyer Rosenstein. It has been my pleasure to take this ride along with you here. Uh, once again, congratulations to the crew of Galactic Zero Two. Thanks again to Virgin Galactic for the views that we got from them as well. And thank you for watching. And here we go. Chamber pressure looks good. All right now.
343 unfolds to go. Indeed. We rise together, back to the moon and beyond. This is nothing to be exciting in the flare, correct? Yikes. He's dead. We don't need any more of these.